Look, it's very late, and uh, I suppose my comments are really going to be addressed to all the people that brilliantly, through this organisation, come online in Asia. And I just want to speak really quickly about three things that are important. Um, I want to speak about the elephant in the room here. And the elephant in the room is, is, is private sector financing the landscapes at scale is the greatest challenge of green finance. And that is the elephant in the room. Now, red and other uh, mechanisms um, uh, are, are terrific and inventive. But we need global finance to fund nature, to value nature and its natural capital, which is central to everything we're talking about at scale. Now, I thought, having made that sort of encompassing statement, what can I say that we, in terms of wanting to come back in a year's time and having seen something that's at scale, that's innovative? And I thought of two examples that I'm involved with. One is the Papuan rainforest in the Indonesian province of Papua. It's the third largest rainforest in the world after the Amazon and the Congo. A number of governments, including the German government and the Norwegians with $800 million, the UK government, have put forward an amount of money to save that rainforest, which is 97% pristine. And there are a number of people, of which I'm a, a very small part, um, working at scale to do something that would be enormous, which is to save that entire rainforest and to utilise the public funds that these governments are putting forward, whereby you have a structure of, of this funding that buys out um, all of the land all of the land at a price fixed. And it's funded, and then you have a situation where that money is used to support ranges, park protection, SMEs, but in fact, you, you put it in, into a secure place. And you use the public funding at the lower level of the, of the billions of dollars that are needed. But then the higher level, you do one of the greatest carbon offsets deal of all time in terms of the top section. So this is the public-private partnership that really deals with the most urgent problem in terms of a rainforest that's pristine. And I'd like to come back here in a year or a year or two's time and say that that is something that's done, that's moved the dial, that stopped people saying we're talking all the time. The second thing I'd like to talk about is something that I have been involved with, which is a thing called I've called the green bond swap. Now, I've been involved in the development of the green bond, and everybody in the landscape says, well, that's terrific, but it has no application to the sorts of things we've been talking about today. Now, I came up with an idea that, that is basically what put, brought down the, the global crisis back in, in, in the Lehman days, which was a collateralized debt instrument. Now, we've come up with this, a concept that, in fact, a collateralized debt instrument could refinance uh, an entire business. And my example was the sugarcane business in northern Queensland, where there are 700 farmers, all with liabilities, you replace all of their liabilities with a giant green bond, and you actually do a carrot and stick. So the, the interest differential with the green bond, which is probably three or 400 basis points, is shared between the sugarcane farmer in terms of his utility, and the rest of it is used for adaptation and enhancement to stop the degradation of the reef. Now, that is achievable. And, and everybody's working on that. We've been to see the reserve banks and everybody else. But the key is not that idea. The key on that idea is how do you adapt that idea and take that to small-scale small farming? Because that is an adaptable concept. Because small-scale farmers have got cash flow, they've got loans. So the concept of a, a large, huge green bond is something that we really need to work on. And that's something that, that the French government, the French Treasury, UND, UNEP, and these other people I'm involved with are working on it. Wouldn't it be good if we could come back and say this was a new financial instrument that at scale had application to the sorts of uh, people, these amazing people that I've heard today? The third thing I'd like to say is I've been involved in the development, I'm the oldest person here, it must be sort of age diversity, right? Um, but, 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 but I've been involved in the development of the UN principles of responsible banking. And wouldn't it be good if next year we could come back and they'd taken out the objective responsible because all the banks knew how important it was to finance this sector. And on that note, I'd say that at the meeting on Tuesday, there were 46 CEOs there. Years ago, I was one of them, but that's a long time ago. But there were 46 CEOs there of major global banks. And I can say that the mood of the people 
uh, not just the Scandinavians, but the, the, the CEOs from Africa and Asia, there were Russian CEOs, there was an incredibly diverse group, uh, is that the green support, the enhancement that banks will give in terms of interest and, and risk reward and all the other metrics that they use in terms of allocating, allocating their funds, that is going to change. And that is going to be the biggest change that you will see from the finance sector in the next 10 years. It will not be the decarbonising of, 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 of managed funds. That, that, as Gates said the other day, that's not going to move the dial. That was great in terms of apartheid. It's not going to move the dial. There's just too much money around. But what is going to move the dial is banks changing their attitude in terms of valuing uh, green in terms of what they do and how they do it. And the next thing, I've been told I've got two minutes, so I'll get on with it. Uh, the next thing that you need to see that comes out of that is what is happening in terms of large-scale farming. Now, I happen to be an advisor at Macquarie, and I'm not going to put a plug in that, but they are the biggest asset managers in renewable energy. Renewable energy is really easy to manage, really easy to finance. Now, you don't need subsidies. What are these large-scale asset people doing? They're actually physically managing assets. And Macquarie and a couple of the French asset managers are buying agriculture in large scale. And they are bringing to that capital and skills on adaptation that we have been talking about today. And they're not just doing it in Australia. I mean, Macquarie's just bought into, 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 into cotton, right, which is highly emotional in terms of what it does for water. But they're, they're sensitive to that, and they're going to deal with it in a way that is innovative and adaptive. And they're not just investing in Australia, they're looking at South America, they're looking at Asia. So what I'd say to you is that these are the things that I think we should hopefully have in, in a year's time. We should have you know, the sort of things that are coming from this large-scale movement of, 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 of basically big things that are going to change and they're going to percolate down to finance the sorts of things we're talking about. And my last comment to you, everybody wants to plant a tree. I've planted hundreds of them, but I've given 300 trees away. Araucaria is the most important tree in Australia. It's the only tree that ever brought the Aboriginal tribes together. Look it up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. This is a closing plenary where we are talking about moving from talking to walking and acting together. <laughs> so up next is Mete Wilkie, Director of Forest Leap Forestry Policy and Resources Division at FAO. Thank you, and now it's good evening. It's no longer good afternoon or good morning, it's good evening, and I'm amazed to see that there are still so many people in the room, and I'm hoping that there are still a lot of people listening in from outside and online. Uh, it has been an absolutely amazing day, so thank you, thank you to all of you. We have had a number, a lot of uh, inspirational talks, uh, champions here, initiatives going on. Tim and I, as you know, have had consultations with stakeholder groups, including with the youth groups this, uh, at lunchtime today, to find out how people want to be involved in this UN decade of ecosystem restoration. And that session we had at lunchtime sort of made me reflect on why do I feel so excited about ecosystem restoration? And I was sort of looking back and I was reminding myself that my very first memory is actually of being in a forest. It's in a being in a forest in the southern part of Denmark with some very large, tall, big trees. Later, I learned that those trees were actually the result of one of the very first restoration efforts. Now, Denmark is a small country and had a lot of wars. It had wars with Sweden and with Germany, with the UK. Um, it also had a big fleet. So we used a lot of wood for building ships, for building houses, for heating up our houses, and for cooking. Denmark is a cold country. So we had degraded our forest to a situation that you wouldn't believe. Um, so they needed to take some action, and the duke of a local dukedom down in southern Denmark decided that he put in place a local law, decided that no man could marry until he had planted either 10 oak trees or 15 beech trees and maintained them for three years. 
This was back in 1737. So just to say that more than 200 years later, some of those trees are still standing. So we have centuries of experience with ecosystem restoration and some very innovative incentives. <laughs> now, when I was slightly older, I spent all of my holidays in another forest. Um, this was also magical because it had a lot of old trees, and, but they were very different. But they were also planted, and they were planted to combat desertification. And no, this was not in the Sahel. This was in northern Denmark. Because back in the 1600s and 1700s in Denmark, uh, together with this over-exploitation of wood, there was also a cold spell where the ocean actually decreased, which meant there were a bit more sand. That, together with the fact that they over-exploited the trees, the peat, the heather for fuel wood, meant that we had a problem of desertification. We had sand dunes moving in, covering farmlands, covering farms, covering churches. You can go to the northern part of Denmark, you can find a church tower, you can stand right next to it on top of the church. The rest of it is under sand. So they decided also to do something about this. This was the government that stepped in in 1858. So they tried all tricks in the book. They started with planting grasses, sedges, trees from all over the world, and now, 160 years later, the forest is still there. And it is an amazing forest because birds and other animals have brought in a huge variety of plants and seeds. So you have a very, very diverse forest. We would probably do it a little bit different these days, focusing on native species, but they really had to try everything. So we have a lot of experience um, and we have a lot of lessons learned, successes and failures, and we should build on that. The third reason why I'm so excited is because of you. You here in the room, you who are listening in, and all the people that I have met in my career, both as working and as just being around, doing things in nature, scuba diving, going from climbing a mountain or out in the forest. All these amazing people that are doing amazing things to help save the planet. So thank you for this. Thank you in particular to the Global Landscape Forum for this magnificent opportunity to look at how can we all help restore the earth. So as I said, today has been amazing. Amazing initiatives, amazing stories, amazing people. And I've been listening very carefully and I won't summarize it, but I will just give you sort of three points for this. Firstly, we need to stop abusing nature and we need to restore the damage that we have done. And we need to do so now. Secondly, ecosystem restoration to me is about hope. It is about restoring that safety net that we all need through action on the ground. And we can all help to make that action and to move forward towards the future we want. And lastly, that the UN decade on ecosystem restoration from 2021 to 2030 is just the beginning, and it's for everyone, anywhere. You here in the room, all of your networks, all of your contacts, we need everybody to come together to make this a success. You hold the power to make the difference. Let's all commit to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Meta. Next, we have Miguel Galado, Director General, Ecosystems and Biodiversity for the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources, El Salvador. Thank you so much for having me. I would like to start by saying, this is just the beginning what we really want people to know is that this is not only the decade of restoration, it is also the last chance decade. If we really want to leave a durable social, environmental, and economical system running, act local and be global. That's the way we want to think. We need to get work on the ground, working from the ground up, sowing the roots from the change, 
And we also mean this from young people who are driving this change. The total area of El Salvador is just at two million hectares. We're the smallest country in the region and the second most densely populated country in Latin America. We have committed to restore half of our land. We show how small is beautiful. Our ecosystems are suffering tremendous pressure because 75% of our land is dedicated to agriculture. So we can say that we have facing a big social and economic challenge. All we need is $1.5 billion. This is a five-year investment for our Restoration National Program. I know it sounds like a lot, but in a period of two years alone, we lost 1.3 billion. Consequence of extreme events related to climate change, equivalent to 6% of our national GDP. This is why we welcome impact investors who can help us catalyze this investment. Plans for local actions are on the move and we are building on the shoulders of giants. Now our challenge is to get this work on the ground and to scale up nationally and regionally. We are thankful for the Green Climate Fund and FAO for supporting our project Reclima, a restoration project that applies a agro-environmental agenda at a national level with the Ministry of Environment and Agriculture. The reason I like this commitment is because it really shows a serious understanding of the challenges of making restoration to happen on the ground. It is not just a technical, it's political and it is institutional. El Salvador is committed to being pioneers in restoration to transform ideas and plans into actions and to inspire future generations to live sustainably. El Salvador is currently leading the Sica region, integrated by eight countries from Central America. Together, the Sica region is home to 8% of the world's biological di diversity, more than 500,000 hectares of mangrove and 1,600 kilometers of coral reef, which, by the way, is the second largest coral reef after the Great Barrier. Together, we have committed to the restoration of 10 million hectares from our Afolu sector as a region. To achieve a holistic restoration, a key piece is to work together with multiple stakeholders, with civil society, private sector, and governments. Let's remember that our ecosystems are very complex and dynamic, so that's why we need to have a robust multidimensional MRV system. We thank Prisma and WRI for developing the Sustainability Index for Landscape Restoration, which accounts of eight sub-indexes related to water quality, water flow, soil quality, landscape biodiversity, carbon equivalency, jobs index, vulnerability reduction, and landscape governance. Alexandria, one of our first panelists this morning, has the picture straight. Four million students went on a climate strike. Youth is asking for bold climate actions. They know they are fighting for their rights. They know they are asking for an insured future. For once, the real right owners are standing up and telling the leaders, you need to change or we will make you change. What leaders don't get is that these kids are serious. And when they get to the voting age, they will choose environmental conscious people to lead the way. Let's stop trying. We have enough information, both technical and scientific knowledge, to make a successful restoration. Failing is not an option. Now more than ever, the world sees and understands the connectivity of their interests, but also the consequences of their choices. Some of the phrases I've been able to write down tonight are with some is what the World Bank said. Business as usual is not an option. We have destroyed an environmental very efficiently. So it should be simple to restore it. We can do this, let's just do this. 
800 billion is two years of fossil fuel subsidies. When we protect nature, nature protects us. Are you with me? We can do this. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, next up, we have Janine Yazi, co convener Indigenous People, uh, People's Major Group on Sustainable Development. Thank you. <clears throat> Lawrence J. Peter once said, an economist is an expert who will know tomorrow why the things he predicted yesterday didn't happen today. And yet we have relied on economists and market-based solutions to address our climate crisis for far too long. Now we have no more tomorrows to spare. And as we have heard repeatedly, the cost of inaction far exceeds the investments we need for meaningful action. It's great that people are now recognizing the importance of nature-based solutions and are committed to a decade of ecological restoration. But I can't help but think about how many countless resources and precious time could have been saved had the voices of indigenous elders been heard when they themselves were child advocates pleading to be seen and understood. Long before Greta, they worked their way all the way up to the UN with even more challenges preventing their participation to raise the alarm for the world to take heed of the direction we were on. But now we are here. This is not just about failing Greta. This, but in recognizing we have already failed countless generations. As the world emphasizes the importance of shifting to renewable energy, my people suffer from the years of forced dependence on coal economies that are suddenly taken away, leaving, leaving in its wake social, economic, cultural, and environmental devastation that cannot be fixed by pitting up some solar panels and patting ourselves on the back for being transformative. Similarly, while many argue passionately for electric cars and for nuclear energy to speed up our transition to net zero technologies, we continue to ignore, as another presenter reminded us today, that the cost of lithium mining carries the same environmental and human devastation, ignoring that we still do not have the technologies to deal with the legacy of uranium mining, no matter what people say about in situ advances, because babies on my homeland are being born with uranium in their body, the equivalent of an adult uranium miner, and no technology is being developed to address that multi-generational impact happening in real time. The biggest barrier to achieving our shared goals of ecological restoration is not the lack of finance, but the lack of recognition of the rights of indigenous peoples and the role of local communities in informing the decision-making and the solutions we need and the work they are already doing right now. Inger reminded us in her speech earlier that in the, the right restoration needs to be done on the right ecosystems. I want to take that further with the reminder that you can't restore biological diversity without restoring biocultural diversity. This is precisely why we have developed the gold standards with the wonderful support of the GLF. Honestly, I was hesitant about that label because the gold rush has had its own terrible history throughout the world, decimating the indigenous peoples of California and other places where this metal was valued over other forms of life. However, the gold standards are not about creating pathways forward in ignorance of the legacy of colonization and the associated human and ecological genocide carried out around the globe but rather requires us to acknowledge it so that head on so that we can take responsibility for this legacy while also accepting our responsibilities to create a different destiny and stop promoting false solutions. So I challenge you all to join us in becoming part of a different type of gold rush, a kind of rush that doesn't perpetuate violence and genocide, but that speeds us towards healing and restoration of all life. A rush to recognize the value of indigenous peoples and the wisdom of their knowledge systems. A rush that restores indigenous peoples' rights to their lands, territories, and resources, while restoring our own collective sense of our humanity and honoring our beautiful interconnectedness to one another and to nature. Let us rush to implement these principles across our work, centering the value of ecosystem functions over monetary gain. We have a lot of work to do, and it will not be easy. In fact, as indigenous peoples, we know the cost of not heeding the voices of our elders is great. Even if we were to change everything today to work to restore our ecosystems, some of our medicines and wild foods, our animals, they won't recover. But seeds sleep deep, waiting for the right soil conditions to grow again. We hope these standards will make it much easier for us to take care of each other, 
so that we can take care of our Mother Earth and sing these seeds back to life. Thank you to the GLF for serving as a critical fora capable of bringing life to this initiative. We invite you to join us so that we can honor the pleas of our children to act now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Up next, we have Robert Nassi from the Director General Center for International Forestry Research. Good evening. I see that there are still a few survivors in the room, <coughs> a few online also. That has been a long week and a long day. Uh, and I'm probably going to start by uh, looking at our sins. And I think we have five major sins that, that we need to correct or restore. The first one is hubris, thinking that we matter. In fact, we don't matter. Uh, earth doesn't need to be saved. We need to save ourselves. Then there is the whole issue of wrong priorities. In fact, fossil fuel subsidy is about $5.2 trillion per year. Military spending, $1.8 trillion per year. Food waste, equivalent to $1 trillion per year. The, global, the Green Climate Fund, $10 billion. So we have to restore the right priorities. We are spending more on pet food than on changing the climate. Now, Another of our sin is doom, fatalism. We, can simply, we cannot simply say, it's too late, let it go. I mean, sort of optimism is compulsory. We might go down, but we will go down fighting. And for that, we need to restore optimism and restore the balance and restore what we believe in ourselves. Then another of the big sin is procrastination. We are running a race against time, and we are not really winning. And it's not about leaving no, no one behind. It's about running in front and bringing, pulling people. So we should not be laggard. So do not be a laggard. We need to act now. And although nature is priceless, there is a high, huge cost for inaction. And then finally, the last thing it's the whole issue of imbalance and inequity. I mean, it's sort of, you know, it's the middle way, the balance. Well, it's not how the work is working. The world is in balance. Inequity is rising. 10% of the richest adults own 85% of the world richness, wealth. 10% of the adults own 85% of the world resources. In terms of emission per capita, the lowest emission per capita for countries, the country in Africa, is 0 0.8 metric ton, 0 0.1 metric ton per capita and per year. The highest one is 43. So there is balance to be restored also. And for that, we are offering the different initiatives. One is the GLF. And now the GLF can help you restore balance. First is by creating a community. We had 750 people registered to attend this meeting. On and off, there was something like four, 500 people in the room. Uh, a few, a bit less now, that's the sort of surviving ones. But we had 9,000 people online for 138 countries. And in fact, via social media, we reached 175 million people via social media. Yes, 175 million. It's a bad mugging number. You will have to ask these people what the meaning exactly is. But we have, and we have been trending in New York. So it, we do better than Jimmy Fallon and things. So I've been trending the whole day in New York. <laughs> so that's the power of uh, Global Landscape Forum. That's what we bring in trying to restore the imbalance and bringing different voice at the table. Now, it's. Good, but it's not enough. So what are we going to offer as C4 uh, and craft also? We are thinking of starting a new uh, initiative which is called Resilient Landscapes. And, uh, we see. and, and if the word that the Chancellor Merkel is having in the conference room number one, we said that we need to work for sustainable and resilient landscape. And, and resilient landscape, 
That's really, yes, it's, it's an initiative that is a big uh, sort of the offspring of the C4 and ECOF merger. And you say that we really, really need to, 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 to go beyond our, our, our context of being a research center. And, 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 and we need to, to do all these things that we want to do, like regenerate the function, protect, expand the value of forest, transform agriculture into perennial sustainable system, mainstream biodiversity, diversify and optimize efficiency, support government and private sector to make transition to sustainable economy. So this is something that we are going to push and we are going to use for that uh, the, the huge amount of knowledge and, and, and data and, and capacity that we have developed during uh, the 40 years and, and, and 25 years of existence of C4 and ECRAF. So this is one of the initiative that we are offering in terms of uh, the UN decade on restoration and in terms of accounting for our sins. Uh, the second one, uh, it's something that we launched with uh, uh, Mark Palai from the European Forest Institute and, and Tony from uh, ECRAF. It's a call for action for forest. I mean, forest, everybody says that forests are very important. I mean, it's still, I mean, since I've been starting in this business, 35 years ago, what has happened is that we have lost on a consistent basis 10 to 13 million hectares of rainforest per year. Uh, we got some increase in forest and temperate forest, uh, but now if you read the latest study, I mean, sort of half of the forest species in Europe are, are, are threatened uh, to disappear because of invasive species, because of climate change. Then you see the, the boreal forest that was a sort of this table, huge amount of forest on the north, uh, now it's disappearing, it's burned, it's attacked by the bark beetle, the permafrost is towing. We are not going in the right direction. So everybody is saying, oh, natural, natural based solutions are very important, forests are very important. We don't pay enough attention to forests, and this is a call for action to pay attention to forests. And it's not about having another conference on science, something we know more than enough. It's about bringing the political power to do something on forests, and I urge you just to follow this and help us having this realized and having a summit on forest. And then finally, we need to be kept to our promise or to action. And I, for that, I'm counting on the youth. And I'm sure that they will help for that this trepidation or this vibrionic movement that we have had during the week will continue and that we will fulfill our promise and all on your commitment. So thank you very much. Thank you for the GLF team. I mean, I don't know who is in the room. Yeah, stand up so that they show. Yeah, no, stand up. Yeah, don't be shy. You have done a fantastic job. And there are many people that you don't see. And thank you very much, everybody. And uh, see you for the next GLF. <laughs>